and welcome to worship on this 14th day of February, 2021. It's Valentine's Day. It's that one day every year when we are most inclined to express our deepest feelings of love to the people dearest to us. We at Frederick Nazarene are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us online today. Ah, oh, Valentine's Day filled with cards and chocolate and flowers and diamonds, items that retailers tell us we must purchase if we truly love enough to send the very best. Valentine's Day, that day filled with romance. While the sentiment behind these gifts can be meaningful, all of the commercial expectations and craziness often leave us feeling empty and wondering what true love really is. At Frederick Nazarene, we believe that the model for true love comes from the Creator God, who designed us to love and be loved. He gave us a guidebook, the Bible, to help us know Him and His love. And God sent His Son, Jesus, to earth to demonstrate His love in person. That love culminated in the, the ultimate gift, His death on the cross and resurrection from the dead. A love that makes it possible for us to know forgiveness and freedom from the ugly sin that would keep us separated from God and at odds with those around us. In 1 John 3.16, the Bible tells us, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. And in Romans 5, 8, the Bible tells us, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This beautiful outpouring of love is so much deeper than just feelings or emotions. This is God giving himself sacrificially to restore meaningful relationship and wholeness to our lives. This wholeness makes it possible for us not only to experience God's love, but to really love those in our lives with an unselfish and lasting love. And so today, we trust that as we sing and pray and hear the word of God together, that you will accept the gift of God's love and grace for you and allow him to grow his kind of love in you. Join me in prayer. Father, would you bless and anoint these moments that we have together on Valentine's Day in worship? And may your love, a love that, that surpasses, Lord God, any kind of possible understanding, any possible way that we could grasp it all. May your love fall in our worship and come near to us. And may we, Lord God, today give ourselves over to your love for us, a love which sent Jesus to die for us. Would you anoint David as he preaches? Would you make our songs, Lord God, a pleasing offering of praise to you? And Jesus, be lifted up in what we do and say in this place today. I pray in your holy name, the name above all names. Amen and amen. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like this.
book of Psalms, Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret space. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. The word of the Lord. Amen. Sing the rains, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And I once was lost, but now I'm free. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught. Welcome to our home. Um, this morning we took a drive, Ashley the dog and I, and we took a drive through Harper's Ferry and we saw all the wonderful snow on the mountains. Such a beautiful time and I wish we could all be together at Frederick First Church of the Nazarene this morning, uh, hopefully soon. But for now, um, pastor's away this weekend and he asked that I would continue sort of our um, 
different uh, looks at sanctification. And one of the things that I wanted to share first off is a quote that I, I really like that doesn't use the word sanctification, but, but hints at it. And it's by one of my favorite authors, uh, A.W. Tozer, who wrote one of my favorite books, uh, which is The Imitation of Christ. But this is from his book, The Knowledge of the Holy. And um, it talks about a concept that when we're looking at sanctification, it's going to become important. So here's the quote. We must hide our unholiness in the wounds of Christ as Moses hid himself in the cleft of the rock while the glory of God passed by. We must take refuge from God in God. Above all, we must believe that God sees us perfect in his son while he disciplines and chastens and purges us that we may be partakers of his holiness. I like two things there. <laughs> the first thing is the statement perfect in his son. The second one is partakers in his holiness, which is always greater than ours. One of my professors at Trebekah was H. Ray Dunning. And he wrote a book called uh, A Layman's Guide to Sanctification. And he also wrote a lot of other books, but that's one of the sources that I'm going to be drawing on today. And he cites three different types of misconceptions that are most common as it relates to sanctification. And the first one is, uh, and this is so sad, settling for a second class Christian walk or what could be so much deeper and so much better and so much nearer and so much fuller. Um, a misconception about sanctification sometimes causes people to just stay where they are and stagnate. The second is when someone rushes in to say, I've, I'm, I'm being sanctified or, or I've, you know, I'm, they're, they're rushing in and claiming an experience that they haven't had. And the third one, is one of the most disturbing is someone who hears it talked about or taught or preached one way, but then they see a disparity between how it's taught and how it's lived out in their life or what's being observed. And so there's this disparity between what they expect and what they see. And maybe we can work on getting to where none of those three are a possibility. And, um, I want to do that by looking at what our church teaches about uh, entire sanctification. And we have 16 articles of faith in the Church of the Nazarene, and number 10 is Christian holiness and entire sanctification. So you see a slide there in front of you. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I encourage you to if you want to. But um, I want to pull out a couple of things here. And the first one is sanctification is the work of God which transforms believers into the likeness of Christ. So let's stop there for a second. That's incredible news because that means that I don't have to do the work. I certainly participate in being obedient and things like that, but the one who really sanctifies us is God. He's the one doing the work. The second part I wanted to look at was we believe that entire sanctification is an act of God, like we said, God does the work, subsequent to regeneration. That just means after you become a Christian, regeneration is the new birth, uh, becoming born again, believing and accepting and following Christ, so becoming a Christian. So it's subsequent to that, after that, by which believers are made free from original sin or depravity and brought into a state of entire devotion to God and the holy obedience of love made perfect. And that's that whole concept of love made perfect is something we're going to talk about. But so those are, those are three things so far. God does the work. It's breaking with original sin. And it's love made perfect. And th those are those are three things. But here's another one. We believe that there is a marked distinction between a pure heart and a mature character. The former, the mark, the pure heart is obtained in an instant, the result of entire sanctification. So purifying the heart is part of entire sanctification. The latter, which is a mature character, is the result of growth in grace. Interesting, isn't it? Because you have 
here something that God does. You have something that we partake in, but he's the one doing the work. We have something that is a break from original sin and happens after we become a Christian. And it's entire devotion to God and love made perfect. But it's something that happens in a point and is expounded upon for the rest of one's life. So those are a lot of pieces to it, but that does a lot to define what we believe about entire sanctification. And I think a lot of people hear the word entire and they think something that's complete, something that's done, something that's flawless. And that's true as, you relate, as it relates to God, certainly. But the word entire modifies the person, not the sanctification so it's, in other words, a progression from just being a Christian to really, we used to call it selling out, <laughs> really putting everything into your relationship with Christ and giving him all of ourselves. Um, another one of my professors at Treveco was Dr. Greathouse, who was, and I'm, I'm so thankful I got to sit under him, but he uh, was one of our general superintendents in the Church of the Nazarene back in the late 60s, early 70s. And he would talk about entire sanctification and Christian perfection, which is another another uh, synonym for it. But he would say, you know, people put all this emphasis on on the person being perfect and not doing anything wrong and never having an impure thought and all those things. He said, but what does it what does it mean? And he said he would take out a pencil. This is a pen, but he would take out a pencil and he would say, this is a perfect pencil. Why is it a perfect pencil? because it erases, because it writes. And he said, why is a Christian perfect? What makes a Christian perfect? Um, Christian perfection is love. A perfect Christian is one that loves. So it's about this right relationship with Christ. Um, it's interesting. That's the perfect pencil right there. It's interesting in our preamble to the church constitution, we see this, in order that we may preserve our God-given heritage, the faith once delivered to the saints, especially the doctrine and experience of entire sanctification as a second work of grace. Remember, we talked about that being subsequent to regeneration. So after you become a Christian, this is something else, a, a further development of oneself entirely to God. Um, as a second work of grace, and also that we may cooperate effectually with other branches of the Church of Jesus Christ in advancing God's kingdom. So I think that's one of the things that um, people often don't think about, is that God's the one doing the work, and so there's not a sense in which I'm unable to sanctify myself. If you're trying to sanctify yourself, or if I'm trying to sanctify myself, we're missing the point entirely. So when we give our lives to Christ, we experience the new birth and we experience an initial sanctification. However, we also believe in a second work of grace, an entire sanctification. My sanctification is not entire and complete, but my entire self is sanctified. I've given myself wholly to God. So if you're a new or recently converted Christian, let me encourage you. God isn't done with you. Um, you don't have to live your whole life um, trying to battle the sinful life that you, le you live. God is not that way. Based on what we know and what we, what we read in Scripture and the God that we encounter, God is never going to leave us somewhere. And the, the struggle between uh, a sinful life and a Christian life Giving yourself wholly to that. I think another thing people worry about is that you're not going to, um, you're going to lose yourself. And that's simply not what happens. Um, there's a famous song by an artist named Damaris Carball. And she has words to her song that say, um, no one takes my life. I give it willingly. And the name of the song is willingly. And, in the end of the song, she has this refrain, and the refrain is, no one takes my life, 
Jesus gives me life. The Lord Jesus is my life. And I think what people fail to realize is that giving yourself wholly to God will make you more truly you and more the you that God intended you to be than anything you would ever be able to do on your own. So let me encourage you there. But I also want to show you what Paul has to say. Paul spends a lot of time in Romans talking about the flesh, uh, what Pastor talked about a couple of weeks ago, uh, the word sarks, about the flesh, the carnal nature, um, what we would call original sin, and the difference between that and a spirit-filled, sanctified life. So in Romans 8.13, he says, For if you love according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. You see the message there. We don't have to live according to the flesh. We can conquer through God's help the original bent towards sin. And then later in Romans 8.29, he says, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Isn't that good? God plans to conform us to the image of his son. Sometimes I think the most mature and sensible prayer that I can pray is, God, please make me more like you and less like me. Um, but here's my, my personal favorite. My personal favorite is 2 Peter 1, 3 through 11. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature. Whew. Having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort, we have to do our part, to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness mutual affection and to mutual affection love. And there's that word again. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, that's that growing in grace, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, take every effort, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So remember what we said about uh, sanctification being a one-time event, a second work of grace, and a process. In verse 8, there where it says uh, in increasing measure notice there's no end to that it's not as if you have to be a certain age or you have to be below a certain age there's no age gap there so no matter how old you are or how young you are or how old you feel or anything else um, that's one of the most exciting things about the christian adventure uh, it doesn't matter how old you are some people think that surrendering entirely to god um, is something that you have to be a certain age before you do, and that's not true. So there's a there's a example of this that I was given when I was in I think it was vacation Bible school in uh, College Park Church of the Nazarene in 19 <coughs> and uh, it's the three circles, and this has been. Uh, if you Google, you know, the, the three Christian circles of, of growing in grace or something, you'll probably come up with some variant of these three circles. But this is the one that I was given. And you'll notice the pre-Christian life there. Um, the circle is your life. And that seat looking thing is the throne of your life. So who's in control of your life? As a pre-Christian, you notice the cross, which represents God, is outside of the circle is outside of your life and the self is on the throne that's how a pre-christian is living <clears throat> a christian has brought god into his life god has come into his life but the self is still on the throne the sanctified life is where god is on the throne and self is still inside and of course we're always trying to move self further and further out 
But you, you look at the progression from God being outside to God being inside to God being on the throne. And I think that's what drilled down for me that maybe helped me understand um, a little bit more. So you remember H. Ray Dunning's book, A Layman's Guide to Sanctification? In there, he says, at the conclusion of Jesus' exhortation to the citizens of the kingdom of heaven, he says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Remember our perfect pencil. A perfect Christian is perfect because they love. This command promise disturbs a lot of people. Perhaps the simplest way to understand it is just to say, is to say that just as God functions as God, his disciples are to function as disciples. Perfect is relating to performing according to one's situation and purpose. We are called to love. Remember when they asked Jesus what the greatest commandment was? To love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. I'm paraphrasing there a little bit, but that's exactly what he says. So uh, Paul in Philippians says, and he denies having obtained perfection in that state of you know no no uh, no flaws at all. He says, not that I have already obtained all of this, or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too, God will make clear to you. In my own life, a lot of things came together for me to grasp this concept of giving my life wholly to God, entirely sanctified. And I remember where I was. I was driving down the road in Seabrook, Maryland. I think it's 193 um, is the name of the road. I could take you there today, even though I'm not sure the name of the road. I can drive there. And uh I remember I was listening to music. I don't remember what the song was, but I was just saying, you know, I can't be perfect, but I, I feel called to more. I feel called to something deeper. I feel called to make you, God, everything in my life and give you the throne of my life. And I remember thinking that um, humility is so important in a Christian life, and I don't like the word perfect. I've never have. I don't like it when people use it about anything. Um, but then I thought to myself, could I live the life that God has called me to? Could I love people the way he has called me to? Can I allow him to develop me and sanctify me? And most of all, can I make God the most important thing in my life? Can I devote my entire self to him? Of course I can. And that's really what brought it home to me, is that it's not something that I need to do. I need to be perfect. No, if you're you're trying to be perfect, it's never going to happen. But allowing God to make you perfectly into what he wants you to be and allowing yourself or allowing him to have the throne of your life and everything is by his will. That that to me is something that that's a decision very, very easy to make. But let's jump way back. We were in Philippians, but let's jump way back to uh, to Genesis. So Dunning points out that uh, in Genesis 17, 1, the Lord says, I am the almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. Most modern translations render that word blameless, um, but it's the Hebrew word taman, and it means... Uh, it doesn't mean one living without mistakes, but it signifies complete, unqualified surrender. It carries the meaning of openness and wholeness. All of these things reflect a perfect relationship with God. And I think that's part of what we're looking at is, um, you know, love made perfect, love as God administers it. And um, a perfect relationship with God, that God is where he should be in one's life on the throne. David uh, Felter is no longer the editor-in-chief of holiness today, but or what we used to call the Herald of Holiness. 
Um, our denominational magazine is called Holiness Today. But he's a former uh, editor in chief. And here's here's his quote from an article um, from 2009. Further, we believe the best definition of Christian holiness is the simplest one. Christ likeness. Christian holiness is about love and the renewal of God's image in our being. It was summed up by our Lord when he stated, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's what I was talking about earlier. Luke 10, 27. And you know, I think there is no safer place than to put God on the throne of your life. Sometimes we put other things there, and self being one of them. But if you think about the safest, most benevolent, peaceful, wholesome, righteous way to live, what could be better than putting God on the throne of one's life and making every decision, every action, every reaction based on the love that he builds inside someone? C.S. Lewis says, I must keep alive in myself the desire for my true country, which I shall not find until after death. I must never let it go or get snowed under or turned aside. I must make it the main objective of life to press on to that other country and to help others do the same. That's what I want to be for you, my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. I want to be someone who reflects God's love in the best way that I can, and I want to help others do the same thing. So as we think about sanctification Let's not put pressure on ourselves that we need to do everything correctly. Let's say that we need to put God on the throne of our lives and give our entire selves to him and let him be the decision point. Let him be the lens by which we see the world and those types of things. And I pray that um, through the sanctifying power of God that we all deepen in our relationships with him. God bless you today. And for some of you that are going to be in in person, I hope to see you uh, on Sunday. But um, I'm thankful that we have this time together. Let me pray with us. Father, I thank you so much for the technology to have these conversations. I pray that you would bless it and redeem it. Lord, I pray that as we look at giving ourselves entirely to you, that we would know that there's not pressure there. There's relief there, and that you're the one who does the work, Father. Thank you for the enormity of what you can do in a life when it's given to you. Father, I pray for that experience. and I pray for that development in all of us. We bless you today, Father. Keep our pastor and his wife and his family safe as they travel. And Lord, bless us with your presence in these times when we miss each other. Help us to hold on to you. We love you, Lord, and give our lives to you. In your name I pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.